Welcome to Perfection's Clutch Installation Lab. Today we've got a 2001 Jeep Wrangler 2.5 liter. Got a few miles on it. So uh, let's see what it takes to put a clutch in a Jeep Wrangler. Well the transmission is almost ready to come out but there was a few things I had to either disconnect or remove. Crank position sensor, oxygen sensor, speedometer, reverse, there's a vent hose, transfer case selector, drive shafts had to come off. This vehicle, the skid plate and the cross member were one piece. There was a mount on the bottom of the transmission that carried the exhaust over there and the slave cylinder. Now the gear shift is up top and you remove a little rubber cap and then push down on that steel cap that's got the notch in it, rotate it counterclockwise and the selector shaft pops right out. Then I put a clean rag in there and now it's time to remove the transmission, the last couple bolts, and take the transmission out. Here's a pretty simple way to keep track of where all those bolts came from. Take a flywheel box or a clutch cover box or even a pizza box. Punch holes roughly representing the pattern of where the bolts were in the vehicle. Put them in there. You can take a sharpie and mark notes on the bolts, you know, orientation or additional comments. But this has helped us out a bunch. Well, there it is. There's our first look at the clutch. But, uh, hey, how come nobody told me about this one screw? <laughs> holding this dust plate on back there, huh? Where was that in the book? <laughs> now having a real good transmission jack that allows you to elevate the transmission, twist it, tip it, very, very helpful because in this particular vehicle, the top of the transmission did get pretty close up here and I had to inch it out very carefully. One bolt to go. It's gonna hang onto that clutch, don't let it fall on you. There it is. And just one bolt to go on the flywheel. I cleaned up the back of the engine a little bit. I did replace the rear main seal. It was weeping. Cleaned up this plate down here. This is a piece of automatic transmission flex plate and I'm going to use that as a flywheel lock. Now I installed the pilot bearing while I was on the bench. And this flywheel has timing notches in it for the crankshaft position sensor. So this only goes on one way. I'm just going to roll it. Yeah, it would be the last pattern, wouldn't it? Each bolt got a drop of medium thread locking compound on it. Just going to go ahead and put the bolts in. I want to make sure my lock is going to work. And for right now, I'm just going to seat the bolts by hand. This is a two specification tightening. First it's 50. We're going to go to about 35-ish to make sure we're seated. Looks like I hit that. And the torque value for each bolt is 50. plus an additional 60 degrees. So I'll mark the bolts and turn them another 60 degrees. Flywheel's all torqued. Now, real important, you gotta clean the flywheel. 
So a good spray of brake clean on a rag, or maybe some rubbing alcohol. But uh, this is not the time to go to the shop parts cleaning tank and dip a rag in there and clean with that. That's not going to be clean enough. No residue, no oil left behind, no slime. And I'll repeat the same cleaning on the friction surface of the pressure plate casting. Now the clutch disc gets no cleaning whatsoever. Now I cleaned up the front housing on the transmission. Also very carefully cleaned the guide tube. The splines, really want to clean the splines up real good. De-gunk them, get rid of all that crud, wire brush them. I'll even take a piece of scotch brite and fold it with a screwdriver blade and rub it on each individual tooth and also where the pilot bearing rides. Very clean. The clutch release fork. There's a slave cylinder end and a ball stud end. The ball stud end on this Jeep and probably the Dakotas is marked with a part number over here. Now I compared this to the old fork before I removed the retainer, so I got that right. Now this bearing is a non-metallic collar. There's a small amount of grease supplied on there and it just slides on. Then I'll seat the clip. But this would be the basic setup to put the fork and bearing on. Now if you were installing the bearing that had the cast iron collar, there's a grease groove down inside the cast iron collar that must be greased. It's a little bit of grease in there, a little bit of grease film on the bore of the collar, and a little bit back here where the fork pushes on the ears. Now we're going to check the disc on the input shaft first. So with clean hands, just get a hold of that torsion damper and slide it on, slide it off. Nice smooth sliding fit. Now there's always some type of orientation to the disc. This one was marked flywheel side so I'll put that towards the flywheel when it's time to install. But please always observe that orientation. Let's lubricate the spline. In the kit we put a small pack of grease. So just take the pack, open it up, and there is not very much grease in there. This is not like you're greasing a big old wheel bearing or something. We just want a thin film of grease on the teeth. Now the idea behind putting grease on this is steel and steel tends to rust. So by putting this lubrication on we're going to slow down that rust and it allows the disc to slide freely. And it's in all the books. Service manuals. So I take the grease pack and just fold it up a little bit and just slide it in on the teeth and distribute that grease. If you had an old toothbrush that you were going to do clutch installations, keep it clean, use that to distribute the grease, that'd probably work out pretty good. And again, with clean hands, take the disc, slide it on. We're just going to slide it back and forth index it and distribute that grease. You don't want a whole lot, just a light film. And then wipe up any excess so it doesn't fling out. By the way, anti-seize, absolutely not. Anti-seize is for threaded fasteners, but anti-seize will spray off and go out and contaminate the friction surface. So that's an absolute no-no. Now I've got the disc sitting in the cover with the flywheel side facing the flywheel. And notice I put a pin to bolt with the head cut off up there. And this time I just put it at the top. That makes it a lot easier to hold this cover on the flywheel. While we get the bolt started. Now these bolts have lock washers on them, so we're just going to allow the lock washers to do their job. Now the alignment tool, insert it in the disc, pick up the teeth, and lift it up, pick up the pilot. Now I like to push that in 
and just kind of wiggle around and you'll feel it find home. Real important to make sure that that disc is nicely centered on there. If it's off center, you start the tightening process, it stays off center, transmission installation time, big fight. I want to check the fit and make sure nice and smooth going in and picking up the teeth and it's in the pilot. Good fit. Tightening is always going to be with a ratchet or by hand in a crisscross pattern, about a half, three quarter turn at a time. Sorry, no air tools for this process. And the clutch cover bolt torque is 23 pound feet. So the wrench is set for 23. I think we're ready for the transmission. Well, the transmission is back in and everything is hooked up. Now, to safely install the transmission, you really need a jack that allows you to run it up and down, twist it, tilt it, in other words, control it safely. When I'm installing a transmission, I'm always watching the gap between the transmission and the back of the engine. So if the top is close, I'll square it up. If the bottom is close, I'll bring it back and left to right and then up down and slide it in a little bit at a time. One other, one other thing too, in a lot of cases the transmission is not able to go in straight, horizontal. It's going up at an angle. So as you go up and in and approach the spline, it's a series of steps sometimes to get it up in there because of that angle. So watch the gap, read the gap very carefully. Now, if somebody would have told me it would have been a good idea to uh, go ahead and install the front drive shaft before I put the skid plate cross member on, that would have helped out a little bit too. Let's start the hydraulics. Master cylinder is attached with two nuts on the inside. You take the push rod off of the arm and there's a start switch. Slave cylinder, two nuts on the bottom of the transmission, and there was two clips that held the line onto the body. So all that's removed. I'm going to try to remove the whole system out through the top. So we're going to loosen this up. Pull it out. And hopefully... There it is. So we'll take this to the bench, take it apart, put our new components on it. Well, this is the new slave cylinder I'm going to install. It's aluminum body, and we've actually got a real bleed screw on there. So there's where the line goes in. I cleaned up the line. There's the new seal, roll pin. There's the new master cylinder, push rod, seal, roll pin, and switch buffer and washer. Now to install it, I just take the washer, the seal, and put it on the line. That would be a good idea just to put a little bit of brake fluid on there. Don't use any motor oil. Don't use any type of grease. Insert it, and all I do is tap the roll pin in, and that's retained. And I'll repeat that process.
for the master cylinder. Now I wish we could present one way that guarantees you to bleed out every clutch hydraulic system there is. But because of the different designs and configurations, the way they're mounted in the vehicle, sorry, we've got different techniques for different systems. We are going to completely bench bleed this one. So there's the master cylinder. Critical. Notice the angle. About a 45 from horizontal. Push right end down. Cap end up. I'll come back to that in just a minute. Well, let's follow the rest of the line all the way down. And it just goes down, 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 kind of hanging down. All the way to the floor. And there's our slave cylinder. Got an Allen wrench in the bleed screw. With this setup right there the way it is, if there was air in there, the air bubble would want to naturally just come back up through the line, doing what it knows how to do, and eventually come out through the cap. Now let me illustrate why that 45 is so important. Let's use this water bottle to illustrate the cross-section or cutaway of the master cylinder. Let's say that we had a remote reservoir. It would be the same basic design, just a remote reservoir. So the fluid's going to come in from the top, it's going to go into the master cylinder, and it goes out basically just below it. There's a little valve inside there that allows this to happen. But as you try to fill this, if you're bringing fluid in from the top, the fluid comes in at the center line of the bore of the master cylinder, fills up the bottom, goes out the bottom, but it leaves a big air bubble in the top up there. How do you get that air bubble to go either down or up? Now where this becomes an even more challenging situation is on the Ranger or some Dakotas. It mounts at a 45 with the push rod end up and it really traps the air bubbles. Let's go back to our demonstration with the Jeep. Now I've got it, 45 with the hose end, the reservoir end, up. So the bubble's right here. So fluid's going to come in from our integral reservoir. It's going to come in, go into the hole in the center of the master cylinder, fill up the master cylinder, and spill down in. But I've got all the air bubbles positioned so they can easily come out through the top. Let's set it up and see what happens. I'm going to go ahead and open up the bleed vent. There we go, got fluid. Okay, so that wasn't too much, a couple drops there. We're just going to add a little more brake fluid. Alright, so I'm pretty certain there's still some air bubbles in the system. We didn't get them all out on the first try. How do you get the rest of them out? I'm down here at the slave cylinder now. I'm going to hold it so that if there's an air bubble in the slave, it would go up. And I'm just going to push back on the slave cylinder with my hands. And this starts to push air bubbles out the top. I'm just letting those air bubbles do what they want to do. They want to go up through the fluid, so let's let them go up. Now there are, there are retaining straps on this slave cylinder. I'm going to push it in enough to where I can disconnect those straps temporarily. I'm not going to pop out all the way. Just going to let it extend. And now I'll get a bigger volume of fluid moving. When I let it extend naturally, it just brings in more fluid. Now we may not be done, but you can already see it's changed dramatically. It was pushing air bubbles, and that last time it pushed a lot of fluid. Now this slave cylinder is equipped with a bleed screw, a bleed vent. If the slave cylinder you're working with doesn't have one, you just skip that pre-fill process and just start compressing it. Look at that. I'm not seeing any air bubbles yet. 
Next, we're going to connect the retaining straps again. And now we'll start checking our work. Now we're looking straight down into the reservoir. And another technique that we recommend and use a lot is you just tap on the line. Screwdriver handle, something, an extension. Tap on it, and oftentimes that alone can dislodge a bubble and send it up. That's looking good. Okay, the $64 question. How do you know when it's bled? I've got the slave cylinder blocked with a steering wheel puller. I'll show you that in a second. But I'm pushing with a substitute push rod. Just giving it a good, firm push. And that master cylinder push rod with the slave cylinder blocked is only moving about an eighth of an inch. And I get a good, firm resistance. When I hit, it hits. It doesn't have any sponginess. It's solid. I've used about three reservoirs worth of fluid in this one so far. That's it. Now to install the complete hydraulic system, just drop the slave cylinder back through the body like you saw it being removed. Put the master cylinder up against the firewall. Push the two studs through the holes in the body. From the inside, put the two nuts on and tighten them securely. Now let's take the push rod and we'll insert that through the start switch, put the foam washer on there, then the plastic washer ring, and this assembly will get snapped into the master cylinder piston. And there it is, complete with the switch, all tightened up, we're done up there. Now from underneath, just insert the slave cylinder into the transmission, put the two nuts up there, and tighten securely. Well, the clutch installation on the Jeep is all done. New flywheel, clutch system, clutch release fork, and new hydraulics, of course. Now, this is only the second Jeep clutch I've ever installed. The first one was a few years ago. I owned a 1952 Willys M38, and that used what's called an Auburn-style clutch, and clutch designs have changed quite a bit since then. But it's still a clutch. A lot of the basic technology is still there. So if you have any questions about a clutch installation, flywheel, or hydraulic system, please give Perfection a call our toll-free tech support hotline at 800-258-8312. Press 4, and your call will be routed to tech support. Now what do you say we take this Jeep out for a test drive, and uh, let's see if we get some mud on these tires. <laughs> 